Today we're going to talk about tungsten. We spent a long time preparing and so there's a lot to show you. There are things that didn't work. There are some really spectacular experiments and some of them we've invented ourselves. Don't think they've been filmed before. Tungsten is the element in group six low down in group six and it is very dense metal because as you go down the periodic table the elements tend to get denser. The atoms are heavier but because of the way the electrons are arranged the atoms do not get much bigger so they pack close together like the lighter ones but the weight is greater and tungsten is really dense. If you're watching on a phone, the vibrating element in your phone is a piece of tungsten because it's small and heavy so that when it moves, you feel it. The symbol is W, which is based on the German name for tungsten, Wolfram, or in English, Wolfram. This has stuck even though some of the other German symbols have disappeared over the years. For example, the letter J for iodine. It has been known as an element for a long time. It's not one of these recently discovered elements. And it is used in all sorts of ways in everyday life. For example, the barrows that you use have tungsten carbide in the tip. All sorts of things that you use have a little bit of tungsten somewhere. Brady got a very nice sample, one kilo of tungsten, and he gave it to Neil, a technician. And as you know, Neil is obsessed by size. So he was amazed how small it was. You and I imagine a kilo being really big. This was just about an inch and a bit across, three centimetres. But it really does weigh a kilo, and Neil, not being someone to take information just from paper, weighed the tungsten, and it was actually slightly more than a kilo. So Brady got two grams free as a bonus. And as you know, that a kilo of water is a whole litre. So Neil devised a really nice little demonstration where he weighed a kilo of water. And you can see how much bigger the volume is of a litre of water than this small cube of tungsten. Neil has a cunning balance, so you can compensate out the weight of the glass cylinder, so you're just weighing the water. I had an idea for a demonstration because I noticed that the density of mercury is lower than the density of tungsten, so tungsten should sink. But molybdenum, which is above tungsten, the group, should float. So, Neil, after a few attempts, set up mercury in a beaker so that we could film underneath and on top. And we dropped in a piece of molybdenum, which had a hole in it, and dropped it in and it went to the bottom. You could hear a clunk and it bounced up again and floated. Went around a bit like a duck on a pond. So then he took a piece of tungsten rod and dropped it in and it sank like a stone and didn't pop up. So I was very excited, but then I thought about the hole in the molybdenum, and he had several pieces with these holes. So he put a piece of molybdenum on either end of his tungsten rod and floated it on the surface like a life jacket. There you go. Don't leave home without your molybdenum life jacket. Brady thinks it's an important safety 
recommendation, if you're ever swimming in mercury, use a molybdenum life jacket. Of course, tungsten is above seaborgium in the periodic table, and mercury is above copernitium. So it's quite an interesting question which will never be solved because only tiny amounts of these elements have ever been made, is whether seaborgium would float or sink in a bath of copernitium. Our Russian acquaintance Artyom, who likes to do chemical experiments for his children in his basement, sent us photographs of reaction that he had done with tungsten trioxide and metallic sodium, heating them up in the test tube. As you know, Neil loves sodium, so how could we resist? So Neil chopped up some metallic sodium, cleaned it in petroleum ether to remove the oil that it's stored under, and then there's the question. In the test tube, do you put the tungsten oxide below or above the sodium? Being Neil, we tried both. First of all, with the sodium above, and when we heated it up with a gas torch, got very hot. But it all seemed to end when suddenly there was quite a short but spectacular burst of light and a sort of psh noise. And our germs recipe said you had to smash the test tube at the end to see the colours. And perhaps the oxide had got slightly yellower. The idea being that the sodium should combine with it and make what is called tungsten bronze, a solid that looks like the metal bronze or the alloy bronze. And if you get the amount of sodium less, you can get a whole rainbow of different colours. So we put the sodium underneath the oxide. There was again a, a flame. And possibly the oxide had got a bit yellower. But then Neil got a bigger tube yeah, it wasn't that yellow before, and was thought it? we would make it work. And perhaps it came out a little bit yellower. He got a bigger flash from the sodium. Definitely, that stuff at the top is definitely a different colour. But, sadly, it was a bit unconvincing. The day after, Neil came up with an idea that perhaps we should have sealed the tube so the air couldn't get in, because he thinks the flash was actually sodium vapour reacting with oxygen in the air, and he's probably right. I read about several reactions that required heated tungsten metal. I had the idea of using an old-fashioned light bulb to demonstrate these reactions. The old-fashioned light bulb has a filament made of tungsten, coiled up very tightly, and it is surrounded by an atmosphere of argon. And if you put an electric current through it, it heats up and gets hotter and hotter and starts glowing and giving out light. It doesn't burn because there's no oxygen there. But if you smash the glass, 
the wire is exposed to oxygen, and if you heat it up, it should react with the oxygen. And I thought it would be quite spectacular. But when Neil did it, of course he enjoyed smashing the light bulb, when he heated it up, he was not convinced that it looked very impressive. So Neil wanted something more spectacular so that you, our viewers, could really see an exciting demonstration. So he then set up a system with two so-called crocodile clips with a fat piece of tungsten wire between them and a variable transformer, which is known in the trade as a variac, so he could gradually increase the voltage and so increase the current and control the rate of warming up. The first time we tried the experiment, Neil didn't have a big enough variac and in fact the variac burnt out and not the wire. Oh, that's what cooked. So he went down and got a bigger variac and that one could give enough current so that the experiment worked. So, Neil began. First of all, he turned up the voltage quite quickly. And even his fat piece of wire disintegrated fairly quickly. Fortunately, Brady had his high speed filming so you can see what is happening in a bit more detail and very interestingly when the tungsten broke it formed blobs on the wire so-called unduloids and we have a whole video showing how this happens on molybdenum and these blobs turn out to be oxides of the metal so Neil tried to do it again but heating it more slowly And very interestingly, instead of getting these blobs, the wire got thinner and thinner and thinner and then eventually burnt through. And when we looked at it afterwards, you could see the wire tapering down almost to nothing. And there's a big contrast between the two. Brady got very excited and made Neil do it lots of times. OK. But I really wanted to see the tungsten reacting with bromine. Bromine, as you know, is this red gas. It's in the periodic table below chlorine. It comes from the Greek word meaning a stench, terrible smell. So you have to do it in a fume cupboard. So we tried heating the tungsten wire in bromine. And I was quite pleased with the result. There was a lot of swirling smoke, which presumably is a bromide of tungsten, probably tungsten tribromide. Eventually, that wire burnt out as well, but it was clear that there was a reaction. And because bromine is a dense gas, it will displace the oxygen. So in the beaker, there was just bromine and no oxygen. And so I think it was quite a nice and quick demonstration of tungsten reacting with bromine. One of my colleagues, Graham Newton, who works in a carbon neutral laboratory, studies compounds called POMs. POM is an abbreviation for poly oxometallates. These are clusters of metal atoms and phosphorus and 
they have very interesting properties. And one of his poems contains quite a lot of tungsten atoms. So his colleague Alex did a nice demonstration for Brady. Um, so we've got a sample of polyoxymetalate, tungsten palm. So 18 tungsten oxide units around two phosphate templating anions. And in the demonstration, he shines UV light onto a solution of the POM. And the light is absorbed by the POM, which reacts with an organic compound, isopropyl alcohol, and extracts some of the hydrogen from the solution. The POM has a number of tungsten oxygen double bonds, and the hydrogen attaches to one of these oxygen groups, so you have OH groups, hydroxyl groups. So you change the number of electrons on two of the tungsten atoms in this cluster. So yeah, I've got a really nice blue solution, as you can see against the backdrop of my lab coat. And again, that's those um, electrons hopping between the different tungsten units in the palm. So that's the tungsten that's bringing the blue? Yeah, yeah. So we've taken tungsten 6, um, which was in its most oxidized state, and we've reduced one of those to a tungsten 5, but that electron can hop around those 18 tungsten atoms. And because they're very similar in um, chemical structure, there's a very small energy barrier, so that manifests as a nice blue colour. It's really nice to see these very intense colours suddenly appearing. And you know that chemists like uh, me always get excited when there's a good colour change. I read about a demonstration heating powdered tungsten, tungsten powder, in the air and forming the oxide, which it was described as a volcano. And so I tried to buy some tungsten powder through the university, but for some reason there were enormous delays nearly a year. So in the end, I ordered it from Amazon and it came in a few days. Though chemically, it might not have been quite as pure as what we would have got from our supplier. And so armed with this sample, Neil got to work. First of all, we began with a watch glass and Neil started heating it, and there was a loud crack, and the watch glass broke. So we put it on one of his heat-proof mats, and he started with a conventional gas torch. And after much heating, it glowed a little red, but nothing very much happened. So Neil got a bigger gas torch that had both oxygen and natural gas and tried heating it with that. And it got redder, but it did not obviously burn. And Neil put on a bigger nozzle so that you could get more oxygen, more gas, bigger flame, and perhaps it was a little bit better. We were nearly running out of heat-proof mats. But then, because he's a really good technician, he had an excellent idea. He used his big torch and started heating up the powder, and when it was hot, he switched off the flame but left the flow of oxygen. So the tungsten, instead of being hot in air, was hot in an atmosphere of oxygen, and then it burnt beautifully. It made this yellow colour of tungsten trioxide, and as we saw with the anduloids in the hot wire, the density of the oxide is much smaller than the density of the metal, so there's an expansion in volume. So the pile visibly gets bigger, 
which is quite strange because usually when you burn things, they get smaller. But in this case, it burnt and got bigger. We were all, in the end, quite pleased. But the recipe that we had for the demonstration, I think, was a bit optimistic. Or perhaps they had purer powder or more finely divided powder than we did. After all this excitement with torches and powder tungsten, I wondered what would happen if we did a standard experiment of sprinkling some powdered metal into the Bunsen flame. Oh. As you know, we've had all sorts of terrific displays from thulium, from yttrium, like Christmas trees. And it has to be said that the tungsten did burn, but it wasn't as exciting as some of the other elements. So there's a very good take-home message. If you're going to make a firework, don't use tungsten. And it's probably sensible anyway, because your firework would be very heavy, might not get off the ground. This video has had lots of demonstrations done by Neil. And he's not just done them, but there's been a lot of thought in what he has done. And he's made them work on the fly while we're videoing. So I think it's really important to stress how important technicians are to science, not only in the UK, but across the world. You may have noticed that our videos are sponsored by the Gatsby Foundation, which is very passionate about promoting the cause of technicians. They have sponsored a new gallery in the Science Museum in London, well worth a visit if you're in London. And they have a really good website about technicians, and you can see a link below. So thank you, Neil. Thank you, all the technicians who are working in science in the UK and across the world. Now, what happened was that two of them, the dilute sulfuric acid and the chromic acid, started bubbling. The chromic acid, when you put in the chicken leg, started to go green.